Thank you. At this time, I would like to convene the uh, regular board meeting of June 7th um, with a uh, school start, if you'll all join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Regular Village Board Meeting, June 6, 2016. Trustee Maher. Here. Trustee Grady. Here. Trustee Penito. Here. Trustee Vandenberg. Present. Trustee Yunker. Here. Trustee Suggs. Here. Mayor Seaman. Here. The first item on the agenda is a motion to open a public hearing relative to the proposed Legacy Tax Increment Financing District. Um, if I may have a motion. So moved. And a second, and then I'll discuss it. Second. Thank you. Uh, the public hearing tonight is in regard to the village's proposal to establish a tax increment financing district to be known as the Legacy Tax Increment Financing District. In accordance with the Tax Increment Allocation Redevelopment Act, the village has taken the following actions on the following dates in regard to the establishment of this TIF district. Number one, approved by motion the preparation of the eligibility report and the TIF plan, and that was done on November 3, 2015. Number two, publish the TIF interested parties registry notice in the newspaper, the Daily Southtown, on November 19, 2015. Announce the availability of the eligibility report and the TIF plan at the village board meeting of February 16, 2016. Number four, we mailed notice of the public meeting to all taxing districts by certified mail return receipt requested to all parties who are registered in the village's TIF interested parties registry by certified mail return receipt requested to all taxpayers of record within the proposed TIF district by first class U.S. mail and to all residential addresses within the proposed TIF district by first class U.S. mail. That was accomplished on February 22nd, 2016. <coughs> Number five, the public meeting was held on March 10th, 2016. Number six, approved ordinance number 2016-0-10 calling for a joint review board meeting and a public hearing relative to the proposed approval of the redevelopment project area and the TIF plan in relation thereto on April 5th, 2016. Number seven, mailed a copy of ordinance number 2016-0-10, the eligibility report and the TIF plan along with a notice uh, of the joint review board meeting and the public hearing to all dis taxing districts by certified mail return receipt requested and to the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity by re certified mail return receipt requested on April 7, 2016. Number eight, mailed notice relative to the availability of the eligibility report in the TIF plan to all residential notices uh, addresses within 750 feet of the boundaries of the redevelopment project area by first class mail and to all parties who are registered on the village's TIF interested parties registry by first class U.S. mail on April 11th, 2016. Number nine, we held the joint review board meeting on April 22nd, 2016. Number 10, we published notice of the public hearing in the newspaper twice in the Daily South Town on the dates of May 19th, 2016 and May 26th, 2016. Number 11, we mailed the notice of the public hearing to each taxpayer of record within the redevelopment project area by certified mail return receipt requested to each person on the village's TIF interested parties registry by first class U.S. mail and to all residential addresses within the TIF by first class U.S. mail on May 26, 2016. Pursuant to the Tax Increment Allocation Redevelopment Act, the village must wait at least 14 days from the close of the public hearing before introducing or taking action on the ordinances establishing the Legacy Tax Increment Financing District. Said ordinances are currently scheduled for introduction on the first, for first reading at the June 21st, 2016 Village Board Meeting and for adoption at the July 5th Village Board Meeting. So, 
At this point in time, I would like to turn the floor over to our village treasurer, Brad Bettenhausen, who will give an overview of the project. Thank you, Mayor. And I will in turn uh, turn it over to Maureen Berry, our consultant from Ellers uh, Inc., to uh, give an overview of the uh, of the eligibility report on the redevelopment plan and project. All right. Thank you, Brad. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Maureen Berry with Ellers and Associates. We've been uh, working with the village for a number of years now on a few of the village's TIFs, and um, I'm just going to give a little overview of what TIF is, how it works, and how it applies to this particular area. So uh, we'll start with just kind of a, 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 a where the area is so that everyone's familiar with where we're talking about here. So you can see uh, the boundaries on the north there are Oak, Oak Forest Avenue, um, and a portion of the railroad right-of-way. Uh, on the south, we're at 175th Place, 176th Street, and 177th Street at various uh, places along the southern border there. Uh, on the east side, uh, we're at the village limits, so that's east of Tinley Park High School. And then on the west side, uh, we are uh, at various points at bordering 66th Court, 67th Avenue, and 67th Court. Um, this area is about 217 acres, and the current uses are residential, industrial, institutional, the high school, uh, commercial, and railroad, and then uh, the, the rights of way therein. So what is TIF? Um, when we talk about TIF, uh, it's essentially a tool that helps to uh, basically breathe some new life into economically slug sluggish areas. Um, it helps to attract private development. One of the tests that we did indicated that there's been a lack of, of private investment and redevelopment within the area. Uh, and so TIF is a tool that can be used to help uh, incentivize uh, new redevelopment within an area. Um, it can help the village to be able to pay for in public infrastructure, such as new roads, sewers, uh, and water mains, which are all uh, pretty urgent needs within this area. And essentially what it does is allow uh, a funding source to be able to allow the village to pay to have a, what, an area that's already been developed uh, to incense some, some private investment versus uh, the much uh, lower cost of redeveloping a green grass area, a site that doesn't have any challenges, is much easier to redevelop and easier to attract new redevelopment. So uh, when you've got already existing infrastructure and existing development already in place, it's more expensive and it's more difficult to redevelop there. So TIF is a tool that, uh, that essentially helps us to, to try to level that playing field. Um, tax increment, the first thing we need to, to make sure everybody understands is it's not a tax increase. Um, essentially what we do is, um, I, I will move to the next uh, graph, which hopefully illustrates this point a little more clearly. Um, the yellow box at the bottom there is the base EAV. Uh, and so that's what your, your equalized assessed value when you get your tax bill, you have a, a base EAV that you're paying and it will uh, basically freeze that level for the life of the TIF. Uh, and then as, as redevelopment goes forward and as uh, hopefully the property values rise during the life of the TIF, which is what that green triangle represents, uh, the difference between the base EAV and then what is realized in incremental EAV in the green box, the green box is what would actually go into the village's TIF fund, and that's what can be used to pay for that infrastructure and some of those developer incentives. And then after the TIF ends, at the end of the 23-year term, which is that uh, red dotted line on the side there, uh, I guess I have got this thing, okay. So the blue box then shows that the EAV, uh, if the TIF works well, the EAV has risen, uh, and that's the total that's available to all the taxing bodies after the TIF is, is complete. So essentially, again, the yellow box basically says that all of the taxing bodies will continue to receive uh, that base EAV level that they're now receiving. Um, it's just any incremental growth uh, over the life of the TIF that will go into the TIF fund. 
Okay, and the process for establishing a TIF is, is pretty long and involved according to the state statute. Um, there's a number of opportunities for the public to be informed about what's happening and there's certainly a number of opportunities for uh, people to, uh, to ask questions and voice their opinions as well. Uh, the first thing you do is, is you identify the property that you are, are considering to, to form a TIF. Uh, you, apply a set of, of tests to it to see whether uh, the area qualifies according to the state statutes in the first place. You can't just make any area a TIF. It has to meet a certain number of criteria uh, that the state sets forth. We then held a public information meeting that was held on March 10th at the Village Hall. Uh, we convened a joint review board meeting on April 22nd. That's a, a meeting where all of the members of the uh, representatives from the other taxing bodies that are impacted by the TIF had the opportunity to hear essentially a similar presentation to, to today uh, and to be able to ask questions about it. Uh, the joint review board voted unanimously. Uh, I know that the, uh, the JRB chair um, uh, Secretary Ray is, is here, excuse me, is, is here this evening and there was a unanimous vote by the Joint Review Board to recommend to the Village Board that the TIF be adopted. So there wasn't any opposition from the other taxing bodies expressed at that meeting. Um, we are now at the public hearing phase, which is the meeting tonight where uh, after this presentation we'll be able to hear residents' thoughts on the topic. Um, and as uh, uh, Pre Village President Seaman announced earlier, the next opportunity or the, the actual vote will not take place uh, on this TIF for another month yet. There'll be a first reading in on the June 21st meeting and then July 5th uh, will be the, the first opportunity that the Village Board can consider and, and vote for the TIF. Uh, there aren't any state or federal approvals required. Uh, the maximum life for the TIF will be 23 years, but the TIF can be terminated earlier if all financial obligations are paid and the village board elects to terminate the TIF district earlier. Um, I mentioned earlier some criteria. The, these are the five criteria um, that actually applied to this. I'm not going to go into all the detail about all of these because it's rather involved. A copy of the eligibility study in the report, the, uh, the redevelopment plan are available on the village's website for anybody that wants to read the detail on this. Um, but essentially we've, we had some obsolescence properties mainly within the utilities within the area. Uh, a little bit of deteriorations. Again, we've got inadequate utilities, uh, lack of community planning, and the lagging EAV that, as I said earlier, indicates a, a lack of, of private reinvestment and redevelopment within the area. Uh, but for having this TIF in place, we, don't, we do not see that there will be an opportunity for this area to redevelop uh, on its own. Essentially, you've got uh, Panduit is the big employer and the big uh, in industrial use within this area. They've got an opportunity to make some uh, improvements to their property that will involve some demolition and some other improvements um, without some assistance from the village in, in from this TIF. Uh, they wouldn't be able to probably stay in this facility, uh, which would be a loss to, to the village. So that's one of the reasons for uh, considering this TIF as well as, again, the ability for the village to be able to uh, make these infrastructure improvements. The age criteria is another one uh, over over 85 percent of the structures, meaning the, the buildings and the housing within this TIF are over 35 years of age. Um, a housing impact study, we, we didn't have to do a full study, uh, although we might have because there are more than 75 inhabited units, but the, the upshot of this is that uh, the village certified that they will not uh, have any displacement of residents from 10 or more inhabited residential units as a result of this redevelopment plan. Uh, therefore, we didn't have to do a housing impact study, and I think that's an important point for all of the residents of this area to be aware of. The village does not have any plan to redevelop this site and uh, have kind of a, a mass uh, movement of, of residents from this area. 
Uh, goals for this TIF plan, um, again, the village similarly doesn't in intend to have any um, scale residential movement. We also want to keep in place the existing uses, the industrial use with Panduit, some commercial use, and some institutional. So there's no, uh, no real plan to change the existing uses. Again, no planned displacement of any residents. Um, one of the, the, the major changes that they would be looking here to do is to convert a portion of the land that's currently being occupied by Panduit um, that's on that uh, northeast corner of the, of the area that I showed you earlier, uh, and also the ABC Supply Company that's there now, and potentially convert that to a residential use. There's been, a, a, I think, some very loose plans put forward on that uh, so far, but uh, the village hasn't, hasn't re negotiated any redevelopment agreements and there's nothing solid on that, but that's just a, a potential change within the area that the TIF could help uh, um, fund changes to. Other uh, goals for the redevelopment plan, uh, again, would be to pay for the needed stormwater management and other water sewer utility improvements, which are, are quite costly. I think uh, uh, the uh, village treasurer mentioned a cost of about $3.7 million uh, to, in total for all of those. That's a, a, a large sum of money that the village would not be able to fund from its general fund or other uh, capital improvement funds to be able to pay for those types of improvements. Um, again, we would have some, some money within the plan to be able to reimburse uh, other taxing districts that had any kind of redevelopment impact as a result of redevelopment within this area. Um, we would also be able to use some of the TIF funds to provide funding to the high school to address some, some flooding and some other facility deterioration issues that they've encountered over the years. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, we could use the TIF funds to pay for demolition of deteriorated portions of the Panduit facility. Um, there's uh, massive portions of that building uh, are, are, have ceiling that's falling in and, and uh, uh, flooding and, and roof damage. So um, it'll be very costly for them to, to undergo these changes. Uh, again, this is just kind of a, a map so that the red square there, it's kind of a square in the, uh, the top corner here, uh, that's, this is the Panduit building that I was referring to. So this uh, section kind of here is the part that's really been damaged uh, and will, will be taken down, um, assuming the TIF is adopted and this all, all, all goes forward. Uh, the the uh, Newer portions of the building will remain, so they'll, of course, stay in this, uh, and that's part of the intent here, is that Panduit will remain at this site uh, and just redevelop the site to be more uh, conducive to their needs right now. This was the ABC property, so this is the area kind of where we would be looking to potentially for some uh, new residential redevelopment. There's another, I think there's an automobile repair shop right in there, uh, so there's an opportunity maybe to uh, put some development in there that's kind of more in keeping with the rest of the area. Uh, a regional pond may be located here to help uh, facilitate the drainage and uh, stormwater management issues that we mentioned earlier. So um, this is a kind of a, a discussion that the village is having right now with the Panduit folks, that there may be an opportunity for the village to, uh, to have some of the land currently on the Panduit site to be able to uh, build their stormwater detention uh, pond there. And one other map that kind of shows a little bit more of the detail about uh, how all of these uh, sewer and stormwater ponds kind of all relate. And this is, this is stuff we don't see underneath the ground, but uh, um, this is where this all, oops, sorry, this all connects. Um, and there's opportunities to link uh, this TIF to uh, another TIF that's located on the north side here. Uh, to be able to use money from that TIF as well to help fund some of these improvements. So um, you'll have uh, a new lines going up Oak Forest Avenue. Actually, that's the existing sewer. The green part would be the new, new sewer part being built, uh, and then some of that would flow into this regional pond. So just to give you a sense of, of what that all looks like. So 
that's uh, the end of my presentation. If anyone has any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them. Otherwise, we can take public comment. The next is uh, for the for the clerk to, uh, as the joint review board chair, to read the statement, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, to the to our good friends that are sitting here, as well as to the village board, on the 5th of April, as noted, uh, the ordinance was passed 010 to propose establishing a TIF. As pointed out uh, by Marine, one of the standards or requirements is that a joint review board be held. And you might ask legitimately, what is that again? And what it is, is a representative of each one of the taxing districts that overlap that site. So you have the park district, you have the high school, you have the grade school, you have the county of Cook, you have Will, uh, no, you have uh, the county of Cook and you also have uh, Bremen Township. Each of those have a right to be heard before anything ever comes to this government. <clears throat> that meeting was held on the 22nd. Uh, the full review was given. In fact, Brad uh, gave the overview on the financing structure and the reasons for it. And at the same time, Maureen delivered what she did just to you, but in more detail so that each of the taxing districts understood the impact to them and the value to them if it goes forward. I should add that you heard Maureen say one thing, and, and uh, it can be slightly expanded, and that is that it is possible during the 23-year TIF for a government in that area to knock on the door of the TIF and say they have a unique requirement and that funding from that TIF can be, assist, can be used to assist it. So on the 22nd, we met. It was unanimously approved that we recommend to this village board tonight. On that same date, April 22nd, 2016, as chairman of the Joint Review Board, I communicated that to this village board. I think that's it, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. At this point in time, um, I'd like to open the floor to public comment. Once again, this should focus on the TIF. There'll be another public comment period at the end of the meeting, but anything that uh, the comments here should be related specifically to the establishment of that TIF. So please step up. Evening. Evening. Several questions I have regarding the TIF. First of all, does Pan do it? Are they involved in the TIF already over on 80th Avenue? Well, they're the property owner, so by definition, they, like every other property owner, got notice of the TIF. No, no, I'm talking about, is there a TIF currently that Panduit's involved in? No. Like no. the 80th Avenue, was, there was no TIF involved no, there? Okay. So Panduit is a privately owned company. Correct. Why should the village spend money to help Panduit? They're privately owned. They can't take care of their own facilities. And if their facilities are in such bad shape as was mentioned here, why hasn't the village done something and talked to Panduit and get this taken care of? Why should we pay for those services? I'll defer to the engineering staff who can tell us that the proportion of what you're hearing today in terms of that pond is not to exclusively benefit Panduit. It's to basically permit the redevelopment of the downtown area. And Chris, I don't know what percentage of that pond would be dedicated to the Panduit-owned land today. Yeah, well, actually for that pond, only about 20% of that pond would be for the Panduit site. The majority of it is for the downtown redevelopment. But that isn't what was presented here. What was no, presented here, sorry. that monies would be spent. I said that, actually, I said that backwards. 80% of it is for the Panduit site. 20% is for the downtown. And not just now, that little corner. Right, right. But, I mean, part of that is also all of the existing storm sewers that have to be from that pond to be able to really, when we look at that drawing, you know, the, the, the key as to why this is, my opinion, important, we've got a lot of drainage issues over in that end of town that we can't address without a storm sewer system. We can't develop the downtown district without a detention basin. You know, so that's, this is an opportunity for us to do that on a parcel of land that is ripe for redevelopment. 
I understand that part, but let's get back to Panduit itself. Why do we want to invest money, taxpayers' money at that, to help them take care of their buildings that are leaking water or that may need to be torn down, which would be the owner's responsibility, not the village's responsibility. And the same goes with ABC. The last time I heard was that ABC was planning to move out of there. If they own that stuff over there, that facility, they should be the ones responsible for taking care of it. Wouldn't you agree? You've got two issues. First of all, Panduit owns that site right now where we want to put that pond. I understand that. So we have, for just not unlike, you know, I can't go into your house and take it. I've got a bargain with you to purchase it, and we're in the process right now of discussing the, the options that we have with Panduit. Those negotiations have yet to be finalized, so I can't even tell you what, if any, it will be. But we need something from them and they have a right to request to be paid for that. However, eminent domain doesn't come into play. This village has not used eminent domain in the 32 I years. I mean, if it's, if it's two, board. if it's two. We have not. We haven't used it, is the fact. Okay, well, let's stick to the, to the person at the podium, please. So, how much are you going to pay for this property? Have you negotiated that fee? How much do you think you'll pay for that property? The, we're, still, we're still in discussions with Panduit as far as the acquisition of the property. And, and we, the creation of the TIF does not, com, does not commit the village to spend any money uh, or pay any money to any of the private developer, provide, private entities that are within the TIF, whether it be a residential property, Panduit or ABC Roofing. There is nothing that has committed anything to the village to, to paying anything for anybody at this point in time other than public improvement. Well, yeah, public improvement to improve their facilities. Public when you, the, when public you consider... The public improvements are the, are the building the pond and, and related stormwater, uh, stormwater systems. That, so uh, helping them demo, uh, demo some of the buildings or fix their roof, their leaking roofs? The conditions of some of those buildings, that's not part of this TIF? It, it can be a reimbursable expense under allowable TIF statute. Reimbursable however, in what respect? However, the village board has not made any agreement at this point in time to reimburse any of those expenses to Panduit or anyone else. Well, that's the problem. It leaves it wide open. So once you decide to accept this, we are stuck. If you decide to accept this, and now you're going to go and say, oh, we're going to go ahead and provide you money to renovate or demo some of those buildings, there's nothing we can say or do about that, is there? Well, the Second state, question, uh, another question. Uh, but let me, let, me, let me clarify first, though. State statute, not village ordinance, is very explicit as to what can be spent or what cannot be spent in a TIF. So this is not a willy-nilly, we can spend it any way we want to at all. Have you looked at have the I, city of Chicago and their TIFs? This is not the city of Chicago. <laughs> We're not much this, different, believe me. We are very different, believe me. You well, can look at a bond rating if you'd like to compare and contrast. Okay, why is Tinley Park High School in the TIF? I'll defer to our chairman because that was one of the things that we've done historically. Whenever we've done TIF um, projects, we have brought schools in as well. For instance, the uh, Fulton School uh, is part of a TIF. Yes, I think the mayor just covered it. Um, there are usually major needs within a TIF if there's a school in it. An example, the Fulton School had a significant need for a, a roof repair. Um, so when the TIF was being uh, struck for the, that area, we specifically made sure that the school was in it, which means TIF money is used for that purpose. In Tinley Park's case, I can't speak to all of it, but to some things, traffic flow, if you're with me on that, coming out, uh, and uh, that's a big part. It's not in their budget, but it's for the safety of the students, our students, and the safety, by the way, of, our, of motorists that are not all ours coming through. That's the kind of thing that the school has brought up. Is Isn't that county road there? Isn't that a county road? Mm -hmm. 
So the, shouldn't the county take care of that and, issue? And, and, and you've seen how promptly they've done those things. Well, um, and, and additionally, I, Pat, I would add that uh, the school property is a zero EAV, so it does not add anything to the value of the TIF, nor does it detract anything from, from the TIF either. Yeah, have you looked at your uh, tax bill lately? I have. And let me tell you, these, the amount of money that's set aside for the schools is incredible. You know, you live, you have to, your tax bill is higher than your mortgage on your house on a monthly basis when you look at it. So the schools can still get money and they can take care of this problem themselves, can't they? On, on the back of the taxpayers, yes, but yeah, part, again, part and of, they're still going to do it. Again, part of the TIF is to is this as our consultant uh, noted earlier. This area is has has reflected declining EAV. As the EAV declines, that means everybody else's taxes go up to pay for the same the same amount of dollars that were previously requested. However, they don't the the school districts tend to raise their requests which means that it's an ever-increasing burden. If the TIF is successful and redevelopment occurs, there is a larger tax base to spread those dollars amongst more, more tax base than exists today. That's one of the hopes of, of creating the TIF, and that was depicted on one of the earlier charts that was shown here earlier. So what you're hoping for is that the redevelopment of the Pandu legacy area would result in New businesses brought in there? Increased uh, EAV? Probably not. We probably do, we do not see that area redeveloping in, in a commercial or industrial uh, setting as, as currently exists. By the way, does Pan do it own all the property up to uh, Oak Park or what is what is that road there? Oak Forest Avenue? Maybe all but all but the corner. All but that one corner. <clears throat> And they just uh, added a new section on to their facility there on Correct. the uh, south. Yes, yes. Yeah. they are retaining, they intend uh, after the TIF is, uh, after the TIF has been established, they do intend to demolish most of the existing structure and re they are retaining at this time their research and development facilities, which is the, what the new addition was, was in relation to, uh, which is at the uh, southeast corner of their site. So everything else, the plan is to demolish? Yes. And who's paying for that? At this point, the, the, the Panduit would be paying for it. However, they have, they, have, they have requested uh, or suggested that they would like some financial assistance, but the board has not approved that at this time. Did Panduit get financial assistance when they put up their facility at 80th Avenue? Yes. In what way? In, in what way? Tax they, breaks? Yes, there was a property tax uh, incentive that was based on retaining uh, their world headquarters here in Tinley Park as well as the related employment uh, associated with the business, retaining that in Tinley Park as well. And, and the board felt uh, appropriate to provide them a, a, a modest tax break with their uh, property tax in relation to that. Um, oh, I have, what we have numbered seven and eight over there, at least number eight. I think that was brought up as being an area <coughs> where flooding was, uh, potential flooding, is that what you said? But didn't we just recently, well, I shouldn't say recently, probably in the last 10 years, build a couple retention ponds just uh, west of Oak Park Avenue and about 177th, 179th Street? That'd be Settler's Pond, yeah. I believe. There were two of them that were built over there, right? Settler's Pond, yes. And that, that was to take that whole area, that at least not, number... That does not take the area of number eight. No, it does not. Chris can explain the way water runs. Yeah, yeah actually, the, the, the pond over there for the Settler's Pond, it's only for the area that's west of Oak Park Avenue. You know, picked up the Barrett's area up to the railroad tracks ultimately, except for a small area, but only only west of Oak Park Avenue. Well, gee, I live east of Oak Park Avenue, and when that pond went in, they took me out of a uh, flood zone. 
Yeah, that, that was unrelated to that, though. There was elevations that were taken for all of the residents out there. Um, and so it was based on elevation when they, adapt, when they changed the maps. So I wound up paying five or six years for flood insurance because of an elevation issue, which was not an elevation issue. The village didn't create the flood maps, FEMA did, and so it took us a period of time, unfortunately, the federal government moved slow to get those maps changed, and that's what the village did. But it's interesting that it changed right after the ponds were constructed and put in, right? Yeah, coincidence. It's just coincidence, right? And we all believe in coincidences, I'm sure. Chris, if, if I'm not mistaken, the elevation changes and the, and the elevation changes related to the creation of the settler's pond uh, were submitted together, were they not? Uh, yeah, really those time frames all ran together because back in 96, we had a huge rainfall event, which actually drove the reason for Settler's Pond. We had double benefits there. Not only were we able to build a pond, we were able to get the Barrett's area out of the floodplain. Without the pond, we could not have gotten the Barrett's area out of the floodplain, which is the area to the uh, west of Oak Park Avenue. The properties on the other side, FEMA had remapped the area based on updated rainfall events that occurred. Um, and so it was all done as one major project. It wasn't just this area, it was also all of the Bremontown area. So we had this going on throughout the entire village where the maps were changed. Okay. Well, I have my concerns about the TIF. Using taxpayers' money to support private enterprise. And we as taxpayers need to stand up and say something about this, and the village needs to do something about this. I mean, how much can you take of this where you keep nickel and diming us to death? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening. Uh, I, in, I attended the uh, March 10th uh, meeting, I believe, on the TIF district to introduce that to the neighborhood. Um, and in that meeting, it was revealed a little more specifics about this. And some of that really isn't being brought out in the, in the open. So one of the purposes of the TIF is the houses in the area for decades and decades have had poor stormwater uh, runoff, and that's caused, caused flooding to the houses. That's something that our tax dollars already should be paying for resolving and should have been resolved decades ago. Um, when you read the complete total potential cost of the TIF, it's somewhere around $81.5 million. About $5 million would rectify the stormwater problem with the homes. Why can't that be done just on its own with the existing uh, facilities budget? Another thing is, when you read the information, it appears to include as much as $15 million to assist Panduit. And I have nothing against Panduit. I used to work there. They're good, good folks. But they're a multi-billion dollar company that makes hundreds of millions in profit a year, okay? So they can pay to clean up their own site. And if I would have willfully allowed my property to deteriorate, I think that I would have got a visit from somebody from the village, okay? Now, you know, making that big retention pond there for the runoff, that may make sense. But at $15 million for eight acres, that's about $2 million an acre. Um, somebody said we have to negotiate with Panduit. That's a terrible negotiation. Well, okay? Now, the people who stand to benefit the development of the previous of the other TIF in downtown, those developers who don't want to have to put on-site retention, they, tent, they would benefit. So why don't you have them negotiate with Panduit a price much less than $1.9 million an acre? Another $3.5 million is apparently to 
support ABC to relocate away from that site but outside of Cook County so that they can reduce their tax burden. Does that kind of seem strange that we're getting a TIF and they're getting money from the TIF to move out of the area to pay less taxes? And again, ABC is a privately held, multi-billion, uh, highly profitable com company. And they're good folks and they do a good job, but they can afford to move themselves. And why would we incent them to move away to not pay taxes in this district? I know Cook County is, is ridiculous with their business taxes, so that's why they and Panduit you know, have moved further and further away from Cook County. But this whole deal, you know, the area that is, stands to benefit the Panduit ABC properties, why don't you confine this TIF to the boundaries of those properties? Because, because the reports show that over the, the time of the TIF, that property, the, the assessed value of the properties, will increase from something like 18 million to 50 million, so triple. I don't think my house price is gonna triple, but blank land that can be developed, that will go up in value. That's, that should be the boundaries of the TIF. The high school, I'm sad that they f have flooding and issues with parking and getting in and out, but the school district should be covering that expense. So if you want to do a TIF, have the TIF be limited to the area that would see the actual economic growth. If the TIF wants to cover stormwater uh, problems that are decades old for houses, that should already been covered already. Um, so, you know, I, I want to provide possible answers instead of you know just covering it all by a TIF that gets masked and everything gets you know whitewashed, and we don't have any visibility of it. And that actually brings to brings a question. The TIF, assuming this TIF does get approved, will all the expenditures, all the projects, be coming up at village meetings on a case-by-case -case basis for those approvals so that those can be approved or not, whether they truly have merit for what the intent is? Yes, I mean, I can, the, the clerk will can get into details as to the process that not only occurs on an ongoing basis, over the course of that 23-year TIF, there are meetings with those bod taxing bodies as well that have a very vested interest, believe me, in assuring that the dollars are used right. appropriately. And, and there appears to be, I don't know if it's misrepresentation, you know, the TIF is not a tax increase. However, for the other taxing bodies, it freezes that EAV for 23 years. Now their budgets are gonna be going up over those 23 years. So that gets frozen, but I think my taxes go up when they, I think my school district taxes go up and, and my county taxes go up and my other taxes, because now they don't get that increase, they're going to increase, you know, their take. Well, there, there's an element to this TIF law is basically what they call but for. And I mean, I can let council probably talk about it better than I can, but that but for premise is that but for this TIF, this property would not develop. So and, those- And I would maintain but for a private company willfully letting their property deteriorate, this wouldn't be an issue. Thank well, you for that, your that, time. that wouldn't build the pond. I mean, the, the pond is the issue here. Well, the uh, pond can be negotiated, but 80, $81 million and, and $15 million possibly to Panduit for eight acres at, at almost $2 million yeah. Dave, an acre? That's ridiculous. That's what your report says. I understand what the report says. And I, well, and why I, do you and write I, reports? I, let me, could I explain that, please? Yeah. 
the $81.5 million, I don't want to use the term a budget, but that is, there are 16 categories of allowable expenditures for a TIF district by state statute. Those categories correspond to those allowable expenditure areas, and those numbers represent the maximum amount that we have set for expenditure within this TIF over a 23-year period. Right. And there's 250 okay, there structures. Is no, there is no commitment that those dollars are going to right. any one person or any right. one thing. But it sets up the provision for that, and, and if there's 250 structures in the area, that works out to $325,000 and, and I would, and I would you can also, buy my house if you'd like to. I'm sorry. And I would, al <laughs> and I would also say that I would also point out that the TIF, uh, the operation of the TIF is, is also limited by the incremental revenues that are generated. Right. If I don't, if I enter, if, if the TIF generates $10,000 of increment, that's all that can be right. spent, period. End okay. of story. And I believe, you know, and it was explained in the March meeting that, that the uh, convention center area was done in a way where it was pay as you go, where, where nothing gets paid until it gets, you know, realized. That's correct. From that. So, so keep an eye on that. That's correct. But even, you know, that, you know, success, you know, touted success of the convention center, there were a lot of houses added in that area that where money went to TIF and not to, you know, the added burden on the school districts. So, you know, be careful about that. You know, we, we shouldn't bear the burden of of helping corporations move, helping corporations clean up their mess. Um, you know, unless I'm going to get some TIF money to revitalize my property too. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, certainly glad point six isn't uh, adopted as a thing. So I'm going to echo the sentiments of the two gentlemen that went ahead of me. Um, you know, basically, this is a principal issue first for me, first and foremost. I think it's not the job of the village of Tinley Park to interfere with the uh, affairs of the private sector. Uh, I'm just going to go say that straight out. I'm going to say that as a libertarian, as a Tinley Park resident, I think it's wrong. But specifically now, now that I've kind of learned about this, and I want to thank Maureen for pointing stuff out with the laser pointer. I learned a lot about this tonight. So supposedly the regional pond's driving this, so let's talk about the pond. All right. Uh, and I'm going to ask a dumb question, so I'm going to go to the water man. I'm, I didn't catch your name, sir. Chris, Chris. Chris. Okay, so Chris, what what exactly is the deal where you guys can't just shunt the water into Midlothian Creek? Does the MWRD say no or what? Exactly. Okay, all right. I just want to make sure. Okay, so there's this flooding issue, and the only way to possibly rectify it is to put this this pond in that pan. Do okay. So let, let's talk about the pond. You know. Is this going to now be a publicly accessible pond that we can all hang out in and kayak theory or whatever? Or is this going to stay within the boundaries of Panduit, you know, and they're going to guard their little pond for themselves? Well, that's going to be determined when a land plan comes in. There's not a development plan yet. All right. So all of this is being driven by the pond, and we don't even have, like, the stipulations or any agreements or anything going on with Panduit, like of what they can do with it, if, if it's accessible. You know, there, there's a lot of money involved with this that, you know, Panduit, like the gentleman af, uh, ahead of me, were saying, well, you know, they're going to get money to deal with their dilapidated buildings that they've let into go into disrepair. I think at bare minimum, the pond should be available to all the people at Tinley Park. Is that too much to ask? Well, I mean, Chris, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is, this is a dry pond with the exception of when we have uh, heavy weather? It, it's actually going to be a wetland pond, so, I mean, it's a water quality issue. Yeah, that's the way it was presented. It's going to be an eight-acre pond or something like that. that it's eight going to be acres, a, right, eight acres. Yeah, eight acres of water available to people. Theoretically, you would think, you would think for all this work, at least the people could enjoy the freaking pond that people at Tinley Park, and now we can't even get the guarantee of that? I mean, Jesus! I'm sorry, I apologize. But, I mean, you know, it's an $81 million project that I think is, we're, we're going with the pond as the driving force, and after all this, we can't even hang out in the pond. But no, you know, and then, all right, now, now I'm going to segue. I'm going to go, I know, everybody's like, oh, man, Mike's in his kayak. All right, look, this isn't just about the pond, and I've gotten onto the principal argument, so we've covered that. Now what I'm going to cover 
is the fact that, okay, okay, I'm going to go back to what's been mentioned. All right, let's just say theoretically, and I'm using this because, again, I'm going to point to the development that's at Lions Pool to this day that only has one out of eight lots built on. Who is going to be developing this land? Who is going to be? No one's coming to the east side, people. You're doing all of this stuff. You, 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 you think, in theory, someone's going to build this subdivision up there that's just that farm stuff now where all the deer come out at, at, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and that's cool. But, I mean, who, who's seriously going to develop there? Now, let's just say they do. Okay, I'm, I'm going to be optimistic. Let's just say that after all this, someone actually does develop there. Now, you're increasing the number of students in District 2, 146. You're increasing the number of students that are in 228. Now they have the, the burn of bringing those people on, but yet they can't, you know, they're, they're cut out from this money. No, so that's, not true. that's not true. Oh, state, it's not. Oh, no, it's not. Please state statute um, prepares that any additional student load that comes out of a TIF district, mm -hmm. there's an, a piece of that increment has to go back to that school district. There's, there's, there's formulas for per, 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 per pupil reimbursements to the TIF districts for a development that has had TIF assistance. To protect that very issue, because that wasn't always the way it was. Yeah, because, I mean, that, I mean, if I was 220... But it is now. Well, I'd certainly hope so, because, you know, I'm not in the purple zone, but I am a member of 228, and I am in 146, and, you know, I would certainly think that if this thing, and again, I think this is theoretical at this point, you know, that you actually got more in. At least, in theory, it sounds like they could get, you know, their chunk of that out of it, which is good. But, like, I'd, I'd like to kind of touch on what the gentleman before me went said, you know, about the whole thing of, what was it, 18 million to 50? What, what kind of dream world is this? Are you serious? In 2006, when I made the extremely questionable decision to buy my condo here, at $144,900, 444, public record, you can look it up. Now I look at my Zillow estimate, and I'm at 83. 83! What, you know, what is even the point of doing the district? This stuff isn't going up. I don't see it going up anytime soon. I don't see this stuff going up in the 23 years. I think this is whole, I mean, again, like what the gentleman's saying, if you need to go and fix the sewers, fine, fix the sewers, find a way to do it in the budget. But going through this whole scheme is just madness because I don't even think the property is going to go up anyways. I think this is a whole fruitless endeavor. And I think it's a way to route money to Panduit and Panduit should take care of their own stuff. Thank you. Good evening. It's very clear that from watching these town hall meetings over the past eight weeks or so, that there's a lot of people on this side of this microphone that are passionate about what you're doing. But I, I really hope that every one of you are really beginning to realize, to feel it even, even if you can't quite hear it sometimes. There's a lot out here that's also very passionate. And they're not always well-spoken. Sometimes it's very gruff. But the past four gentlemen came up and spoke. I have like three things left to say. I had a scroll before I got here tonight. So I also realized that in a situation like this, it's very easy to put words in people's mouth. And out of respect for Mr. Bettenhausen, I would, would just like to ask you to clarify your, one of your answers previously. You mentioned that for that property north of 175th and east of Ridgeland, that the board really didn't have an expectation of industrial or commercial. So could you just, just for layman's terms, in case somebody's just missing it, clarify exactly what's left? What are you expecting from that? What do you expect is going to be built there? Well, that's, that's not my area of, of Well, but I'm just, with your comment, but, I don't want to put words will, in your I will mouth. say that the area is all residential by, to, and you've got Panduits opened their doors there in 1960. Um, as the town f continued to develop, it's kind of an island onto itself. It doesn't necessarily lend itself well for redevelopment as a commercial, as a commercial site or, a re or an industrial site to continue that use. So, okay, so with that in mind, and thank you, thank you for that candid response. I really appreciate that. With that in mind, can someone please under just explain to me in any terms you can, why the documentation goes through such flowery poppycock language to tell me that this is all about, oh, industrial and commercial, and when it's clearly not. 
I mean, I've heard this song and dance before, and not just from the village here and past incidents of the past couple of years, from other places I've lived as well over the years. And it, you know, I th really think that some of the people in this room, one of, the, one of the issues that I've heard people say, and they haven't told me directly, but I've just sat back and listened because I came early because I like to listen to people, they don't trust you. There are some of you on this board, you could go out at 12 noon, look at the sun, and say, wow, it's bright in the sky, and they wouldn't believe you because they feel like they've been burned. Accidental or deliberate, you've got some things you still have to overcome. And there's something that's not being heard. These people are tired of hearing new residential, new residential, new residential, and no one's fixing the drainage in the area first. It's like we're putting the cart before the horse. And then we're putting blinders on the horse, and then we're putting a nail in one of his hoofs. And we're gonna be upset because the horse can't stay on track. We set the horse up for failure. I mean, it's common sense. And I know some of you get it. And I pray and hope the rest of you do. I really do. Because these people want this to succeed. They want these neighborhoods to grow, to strengthen, to get better. They want solutions. They want the economy to come back. But it's not going to come back when all this money is being shunted into projects that really more directly benefit corporation which already has a clear foot outside of the same county as this district. And again, if you look at their website today, anyone count the billions that they themselves say they're worth? Anyone? Bueller? <laughs> I'm just I'm just I'm not hearing it and I feel like it's common sense. And I'm not and I'm not saying that to be insulting. I apologize if, I, if that comes across that way. But that's the level of frustration. That, the, that many of these people have, and I mean, it's, just, it's just that high, you have to realize that. And hiding behind you know, some of the procedural things that sometimes governments do, that's just gonna delay. That's not going to help resolve this now. And one other observation, it was mentioned earlier that there was the intergovernmental meeting with uh, the Redmond Township and other different government units that'll be affected by this. Um, has anyone on the board or on the stage ever heard of a government unit not voting for a budget increase or more funding of any kind whatsoever? Because in my life in Illinois and outside of Illinois, I've never heard of it. I'll let the clerk answer that. Yes, let me, uh, on, on most of these joint review boards during the first years of TIFFs, and some of us on this board have tremendous caution with regard to TIFFs, but on the first until the state changed it, many of the TIFFs were defeated at that joint review board level. What they had to change is to make sure that if extraordinary costs develop during the 23-year TIF period by a school, by a park district, that that TIF had to find the money to help correct that problem. Before that time, it didn't. Now, I want to add this. Tinley Park has five TIFFs. Our early TIFFs our early TIFFs had all of those recaptures in it voted by this village board. Then the state came through about 15 years later. Okay. My last question that I didn't quite, maybe somebody asked this, and, and forgive me if I'm repeating something here, but we saw that graph with three different colors, and it was kind of the upward triangular trajectory. And I'm kind of curious. Um, that's projecting a really rosy picture, but does anyone have the graph that shows the actual picture? Uh, for say every TIF in Tinley Park's history or Cook County or any of the other governmental units that we overlay with that would be involved with this. Uh, because you know right now my wife and I are about to buy a house and we live in that TIF. And we were the only house in our block that wasn't under water under that last major flood. I mean I had to go help elderly ladies who were crying because they were afraid their houses were going to flood to help get them bailed out. So when, you know, I'm hearing a lot of things, but this is the level of frustration that the people that are living just south of 175th and east of Ridgeland and some, or east of Ridgeland or some west, that's what they're feeling. And you know, they're working two, three jobs to afford those small properties and pay the taxes, and they can't come to these meetings two, three times a month, four times a month, however many times a month. They watch it after the fact. They don't have as easy a time to come here and talk to you face to face and tell you, I'm angry about what you said, or I really like what you said, or I don't like this, or I want this. They don't have that. 
but they sure pay their taxes on time. And they, they, you know, I just think they deserve as, as, as good of flood control as the folks south of 80 or west of Harlem. I don't think they're any less worthy of people. I don't think their tax dollars are any less of a dollar value than any other tax dollars. But you know, that's kind of a sentiment that's going through that neighborhood. And I've got a lot of my neighbors telling me that when they come time to retire, they're gone. And what kind of community are you gonna have when everyone who's been there for years raising their families, raising their children, their grandchildren, building up their homes? What do you expect it's gonna be like, regardless of the SIF? I mean, I, re you really, I really challenge you to think about that.